Good morning, everyone. Please continue those chats over a cup of tea or coffee after the sermon. Um, I'll be reading our second Bible reading. Um, my name's Romy. Should have mentioned that. Um, if you've got a pew Bible, it's on page uh, 1550. Um, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they, they were staying... Oh... Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya where Cyrene, near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Thanks, Romy. Um... Be great if you can uh, flick back to Genesis chapter 11. That's where we're going to be spending our time, but that Acts 2 reading might give you a hint as to where we're heading. Uh, let me uh, pray as we come to look at God's word together. Uh, Father, we do thank you that we can gather together this morning. We thank you that we can gather from different languages and nations, and we come together under the name of the Lord Jesus. And uh, we pray today as we think about uh, your word from Genesis 11, uh, that you would be teaching us about what it is that uh, you have done to unite us uh, together in his name. And uh, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, earlier this year, we uh, had a holiday in Brisbane. And uh, one of the must-do uh, tourist experiences, we were told, was to go up the Brisbane clock tower. Um, so we booked a uh, time and uh, you go up with a tour guide in a very small elevator. Uh, if you're afraid of heights, it might not be for you. Uh, the clock tower is 90 metres tall. And uh, on the tour, the guide um, told us about the tower and its history, um, how construction on it started in 1920. And for many years, it was the tallest building in Brisbane. Um, and our tour guide was clearly very proud of uh, the Brisbane clock tower. Uh, one thing she told us was that uh, Brisbane and Sydney both began building their clock towers at the same time in 1920. And obviously there was a little bit of competition as to whose was going to be the biggest and the best. Um, Brisbane ended up having an advantage because theirs took longer to build, which meant they could make sure theirs ended up being four or five metres taller than the one in Sydney. And uh, to this day, it remains the tallest clock tower in Australia. Now, I'm sure that when it was built, <clears throat> it would have been quite impressive and uh, would have been one of the, you know, would have had a great view from the top. Um, but one of the funny things about going up the Brisbane clock tower today is that when you get to the top, uh, there's now only a good view over the city in one direction. Because on the other three sides, it's all been built out by massive buildings that now surround it. Um, but this is what we do, isn't it? Uh, this is what societies do. This is what humanity does. We build bigger buildings. We build monuments. We build these great structures. Uh, we have the seven wonders of the ancient world, uh, the pyramids, the mausoleum, the Temple of Artemis. We've got the seven wonders of the modern world, the Taj Mahal, the Colosseum, the Great Wall of China. Uh, you can look up the lists, but these, these buildings are a sign of our significance. How do you know it's a great city? How do you know it's a great civilization? Well, look at the buildings that they have built. 
But this, I think, is not just the domain of engineers or property developers, um, but for all of us, uh, each, of his, each of us in our hearts are builders. Uh, we are tower builders. Uh, we are all seeking to build, to construct something that will prove our significance. Um, verse 4 of our passage today rings true. We want to build something so that we make a name for ourselves. And see, there could be all kinds of things that we construct in order to do that. It might be a building with your name on it, but it might be building your career. It might be building your reputation. It might be constructing a social media following, building a perfect relationship or a home. It could even be building a church ministry. But the question is, where is it that we are seeking to build a name for ourselves? Because this tendency that we have is that we build these things not for God's glory and for the sake of his fame, but we do it for our glory and for the significance of our name. And this pull of our hearts to build for ourselves, for our own significance, we see today goes all the way back to Genesis and to the building of the Tower of Babel. Uh, it's here that we see humanity gather together to build this great city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Uh, but they don't do it for God and his glory, rather it's to show their own strength, their own significance, to show what they can achieve in life without him. So today we're going to have a look at this story from Babel in Genesis 11 and um, here's three things for us to consider. Firstly, we'll think about the tower builders. Uh, we'll see their motivations and how God responds to their self-centred building project. Second, then we'll consider the two cities and uh, what we'll notice here is how this episode here in Genesis 11 is really just the start of a thread that runs all the way through the Bible asking us which city or which building do we belong to. And finally, we reflect on how God has given us one name under heaven, the name above all names, and we'll see how when we live for his fame, we no longer need to build our own name because we find a far greater security and significance in being found in him. So first of all, uh, let's think about the tower builders and their motivations. <clears throat> Now, the story of the Tower of Babel here, it's um, pretty brief. It's just nine verses. Um, but you'll notice it's surrounded here on either side uh, by some long lists of names. Um, so we're going to begin in chapter 10 today. And you notice that the start of chapter 10, um, it begins there with the words, this is the account of. And through the book of Genesis, that's a phrase that you see appear 10 times through the whole book. And every time it's introducing a new section. So today, 10 verse 1, this is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. So here's this new section, a new beginning. We're now introduced to the world that exists after God's act of recreation that we thought about last week in the flood. And chapter 10 uh, in our Bibles is titled there, The Table of Nations. Uh, because this list of names here, the, the names that are listed are often not just individuals, but they stand for a whole people group or a nation. And uh, we won't read over all of it, but it's, you know, it's a group with great diversity, um, geographically and socially, politically, economically. And um, maybe Genesis 10, you might not find it the most interesting book uh, chapter in the Bible to read, but... Um, in the flow of Genesis, it's really quite a positive chapter um, because God's purpose right from the beginning has been, he said to Adam and Eve, uh, be fruitful and increase in number, uh, spread out, fill the earth. And chapter 10 is showing us how that is being taking place, how that's being fulfilled. But there's one particular verse in chapter 10 that I do want you to notice, uh, chapter 10, verse 25. So now this is in the line of Noah's son Shem. Let me read it, verse 25. It says, um, two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg because in his time, the earth was divided. His brother was named Joktan. Now you might have a footnote there in your Bible that says that Peleg means divided. And this is an important little verse because it's saying that 
it's at this time in Peleg's lifetime, this is when the Tower of Babel happens. This is when the earth is divided. And so that brings us then to chapter 11, where we're told about this event that divides the world. So let me read again from 11 verse 1. It says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in China and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So the situation described for us here is that humanity um, has a common language and we see they also have a common purpose. Their purpose is to build this city which, uh, and with a tower which reaches to the heavens. Um, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. I think as you read that, you notice the problem. Uh, really, there's two problems. Uh, the first is instead of filling the earth, they're staying in the one place. Uh, they found a plain in China that's in Babylonia, and they settled there. But second, instead of living for God's glory, they're living for their own name. Now, I'd want to say as well, um, the problem here is not that God is against cities. Um, for those of you who live on a farm, uh, it's nothing wrong with cities. Now, the, the problem is about the intention of their hearts. Uh, they build this city in defiance of God's command and for their own glory. Um, rather than trusting God to keep them and protect them and bless them as they go out and fill the earth, well, they seek to be secure and to build a secure place by themselves. And their intention or their motivation here is quite obvious. It's not to see the glory of God spread to every corner of the earth. Their concern is for their own glory. And so they build this city and this tower to construct their own security and significance. They build a tower that reaches to the heavens, not so they can worship the Lord of heaven, but in order to make a name for themselves. And look, no doubt in their minds, it was probably a fairly um, significant and impressive structure that they built on the plain in China. Um, here's a picture. Um, I mean, no one had photos, but here's a picture of what it might have looked like. Um, that's kind of a, a, a guess of what they might have built, that kind of a structure, fairly impressive structure. But take a look now at verse 5 as we see it from God's perspective. Verse 5 says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. See what's going on there? Seeking to build this tower that reaches to the heavens, but the Lord needs to come down just to see it. Uh, we might think that the things that we build are fairly impressive, but really that's from our perspective, isn't it? Um, the Brisbane clock tower might look impressive from ground level, but fly over it in a plane and it just looks like a tiny little dot. And so the Lord has to come down in order to see this magnificent tower that the people are building. And when he sees it, his response is much like how he responded to Adam and Eve and their rebellion in the garden, because not only does God here see how ridiculous their plan is, but he also sees the danger of what they're doing. So verse 6, the Lord said, If as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Now, it's not here that God is threatened by them, uh, he's not worried that they're actually going to make it to heaven and overthrow him or something like that. No, it's that God knows that they are a threat to themselves. And if their evil is left unchecked or unconstrained, they'll, then there'll be no limit to the evil that they can do. And worse of all, in their pride and their self-sufficiency, they will no longer recognise their need for God and for his salvation 
as they harden their hearts toward him. And so like we saw last week, well, God in his kindness intervenes. In verse 7, he says, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. And that is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So these proud tower builders gathered together against God's purpose for his creation and now scattered so that God's plans will be fulfilled. So the problem here is, is that they are, they are united in the wrong thing. Uh, they're united in their defiance of God. And so God confuses their language so that they can no longer communicate with each other. And you can imagine how that might have caused a bit of upset on the building site. Now they can't understand each other, people are just yelling over the top of each other in their own language and the building of the city stops. But that's not where the story stops and, and that's not where Babel stops. Um, because the point of the Tower of Babel is not that it just happened this once, but that it happens again and again. Uh, because when the tower builders scattered, they didn't stop building towers, they just started building their own towers wherever they went. Because this is what we do as we seek to make a name for ourselves. And so this episode in Genesis 11 we see is really just the start of a thread that runs all the way through the Bible asking us which city or which building will we belong to? Because the picture in the Bible is that there are two cities. There is the city of Babel, the city of man where we build for our own name and our own significance but there is also a new city the city of god where he gives us a name and significance by his grace so point two um, the two cities now we saw that um, the city that the people built here is called babel and um, in hebrew that means confused um, sounds like a little bit like the English word Babel, doesn't it? And uh, we're also told that the place where Babel is built is on the plain of Shinar, which is ancient Babylonia. And so in this time, this city becomes Babylon. Babel becomes Babylon. And, and Babylon is a proud city. In their, in their language, um, Babylon doesn't mean confused. It means the gate of God. Uh, they saw their city as a place from where they might ascend to the heavens in order to take their seat next to the gods. And through the Bible, we see that in her pride, Babylon represents a way of living in the world that is opposed to God. Uh, Babylon is the great enemy of God's people. It represents an approach to life where it's all about me and making a name for myself and Babylon is really the God-hating, self-loving, spiritual city of sin. But the great danger throughout the Bible for God's people is that Babylon is also seductive. Uh, Babylon is impressive and she seeks to draw us in. Um, in the book of Revelation, uh, Babylon is depicted as a woman dressed in purple and scarlet, glittering with gold precious stones and pearls. She's a picture of the wealth and luxury and security of this world. And she promises us those things if we would just reside within her walls. And we feel the pull of Babylon every day, don't we? The desire to settle down in this world, to make uh, our home here, to just live a comfortable life. That is the call of Babylon. But see, the Bible presents us with a choice because in God's grace, there is another city, which is his city, which he calls us to belong to. And so through the Bible, if, if um, Babel, or Babel or Babylon represents all that's opposed to God, then Zion or Jerusalem represents God's city and his kingdom and his way of living in the world. And we've uh, seen in this um, chapter today uh, the beginnings of Babylon in the city of Babel 
And uh, we also see in this passage the beginnings of this other city, the city of God. Or at least we're pointed towards it in uh, the genealogy that follows after the Babel story through the rest of Genesis 11. Because if you take a look there again, uh, verse 10 of chapter 11, it says this. Um, it says, this is the account of Shem's family line. Now, we actually read an account of Shem's family line before in chapter 10. But now in chapter 11, we're given that line again, but with a bit of a tweak. It takes a bit of a different direction. Um, I don't know if anyone's into Ancestry.com. Has anyone done that? Track to your ancestry. If you like that, you might like these chapters. And um, I've tried to kind of represent what's happening here in this excellent graphic um, because we do need a graphic designer for the church, don't we? Um, in chapters 10 and 11, you get, the, you get these genealogies, but I want you to see how they take a slightly different direction. So they both start with Shem, uh, Noah's son. They, all, they both make their way down to Eber, and uh, Eber is where we get the name Hebrew from. So this is the beginning of the Hebrews. Um, and uh, Eber has these two sons, Peleg and Joktan. And remember, we saw before that it was in Peleg's time that the earth was divided. But now I think we see that it's divided by more than language. And the bigger division is about this way of living in the world. And so in chapter 10, the genealogy follows Joktan and leads to the tower builders. But if we follow the list down in chapter 11, well, this time the genealogy follows Peleg and it goes all the way down to one of his descendants, Abram. And we won't think too much about Abram today because we'll do that next week. But if you look now to the start of chapter 12, it's here that we see the start of this new line and this new city or this new way of being in the world. Uh, because now in chapter 12, the Lord appears to Abram and he makes promises that will shape human history from this point on. So the Lord says to Abram, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so here now is the division in the world. Here are the two cities to belong to or the two ways of being human. There's the way of the self-sufficient tower builders where you make a name for yourself without God or there's the way of trusting in God's promises, allowing God to give you a name becoming part of his great nation, receiving from him your security and significance. The city of Babel or the city of God. And there was this choice back then for the tower builders and for Abraham to make, which city would they belong to? And there's still that same choice for us to make today. So is my life going to be, be about what I can do what I will accomplish, what I will build, what I will make of myself? Or is my life going to be about what God has done and what God will do and what he promises to make of me? And we also see through the Bible that it's also the choice between the way of judgment and the way of blessing. So if you go to the end of the Bible again in Revelation, well, Babylon in the end, is seen to be a prostitute judged by God and thrown into the sea. Whereas the new Jerusalem is a beautiful bride dressed to be married to the Lamb and to live with him forever in the city of God. And as we live now in the world, well, we are now asked to define our allegiances, to choose which city will we belong to. The call in Revelation is to come out of Babylon and to come and be part of the bride of the Lamb. So how do we do that? How, do, how can we come out of Babylon and live for God and his kingdom? 
How do we stop building our own towers? How do we turn our back on the allures and attractions that Babylon offers us? I think we'll only do that when we see what God in his grace has given us in the gospel of Abraham's greater son. Because the gospel is that God has come down to us. The good news is that we don't need to build a tower to him because God has come down to us in his son. And he has come not to judge the world and to scatter the people like a babel, but he's come to save the world and to gather and to unite us again. We see that this is what Jesus does in his ministry. He comes to seek and to save the lost. And we see that this is what Jesus achieves as he goes to the cross where he he pays the price for our sin so that all who believe in him would receive not God's judgment but receive the promises, the blessings promised to Abraham. As we become part of his people, we escape the curse and we receive the blessing. But it's also at the cross that we see where Jesus now divides the world. Because to be gathered to him means that we need to humble ourselves. To stop thinking that we can build our own way to God and to trust instead in the one name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Those who in their pride refuse to be gathered by his grace will remain scattered. But to all who come to him, Well, he gives us everything that we are hoping to build for ourselves. He gives us the security of an enduring city whose architect and builder is God. He gives us the significance of a name written forever in the Lamb's Book of Life. And right now he gathers us together into his church. He unites us together as people who no longer build for our own name because we now live for his name. We saw the very start of this in our reading there from Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. It's the day when the Holy Spirit comes on the church, is given to every believer. And it says that on that day there were gathered in Jerusalem people from every nation under heaven, uh, representatives of those who had been scattered on the day of Babel are there present, gathered for this feast. They'd been divided by one thing, by language, but God came down and they began to speak so that everyone heard the gospel in their own language. As the Spirit enabled, they heard, declared the wonders of God in their own tongue. It's a little picture of Babel reversed. But ultimately we see that this is what God is building a multitude from every tribe and language and people and nation gathered and united in the new kingdom, the new people of the Lord Jesus. And we experience that, we taste that now in the church. Um, As the gospel now goes out to the ends of the earth, well, this is the great building project that God is doing, building the kingdom of his son, uniting us with one another, breaking down the barriers of language and culture and wealth and politics as we unite now in the common purpose of declaring the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. Because when we live for his name, we no longer need to build for our name. And so this is what Babel asks us. The Tower of Babel asks us, what is our life going to be about? Is my life going to be about building my own tower in Babylon? About seeking to build my own security and significance to make a name for myself? Or am I willing to trust God for the name and the city and the significance that he will give me? Am I willing to give away my life in order to build his kingdom? Will my life be about lifting up and proclaiming 
the only name that is truly worthy of praise, the name of Jesus. Let me pray that that might be how we respond as God's people gathered by him today. Let's, uh, let's pray. Our Father God, today we do, um, as we come to you in the name of Jesus, then, Father, we confess that so often we do live for ourselves and our own glory rather than yours. So, Father, I pray that you would give us a vision of this better kingdom that you are building, which is ours in Christ, which cannot be shaken, and that we would live our lives each and every day for you and your glory. And we ask that in Jesus' name.